A thousand years ago, a small group of Polynesians paddled the world's greatest ocean in search of a new land. For generations, their ancestors had expanded eastwards in the vast Pacific Ocean, guided only by the stars. A new piece of land was found. The settlers of this tiny virgin island called their new home Tepito Otehenua, meaning the navel of the world. The name was seen fit as they were thinking that there can be no place more distant than this. And they were right. Generations passed and the inhabitants of what was to be known as Rapa Nui built a civilization of art, capable of carving, raising and transporting hundreds of gigantic monolith statues using nothing but their own hands and stone. A glyphic writing called Rongo Rongo was evolved. A culture had risen full of achievements, intellect, music and legends against all odds in an environment where one would least expect it. Children were well taught of their history and of who they are. Up until today, the Rapa Nui people remember their lineage back to the time when King Hotumatua disembarked at the beach of Anakena lifetimes ago. We appreciate your support. If you enjoyed this content, we kindly ask you to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to our channel for more updates and future videos. Your support means a lot to us and helps us continue creating valuable content. Thank you. Here we go. 1500 to 2000 BC, Southeast Asian settlers started expanding to the east into the Pacific Ocean. Being extremely isolated and located so far to the east, Rapa Nui was probably the last island to be settled in this expansion. Even today, linguistic traces can still be found in Southeast Asia from the time before the expansion to the Pacific Ocean had started, 4,000 years ago. Settlement Approx 1000 AD. The settlers reached Easter Island. They found it lush with palm trees and other endemic vegetation growing all over the island. They gave their new home names fitting an island of such isolation, such as Tepito o Tehenua, the navel of the world, and Matakite Rangi, eyes looking towards the sky. After a while, a second migration of only men arrived to the island. The new inhabitants had a different appearance. They were short and wide. They had a tradition of elongating their earlobes so that they hung down to the shoulders, a tradition that was later practiced also by the first group of settlers. To distinguish the two races, they were given names. The first group was called Hanao Momoko, Momoko being a duplication of the word Moko, lizard, referring to that the people were tall and slender. The second group was called Hanao Eepe, Eepe meaning broad or bulky. At some point in time, all but one of the Hanao Eepe were exterminated by the Hanao Momoko, which means that the Rapa Nui people of today are mainly descendants of the Hanao Momoko. Hanao Momoko, the first settlers of Easter Island. The first settlers of Easter Island are known as Hanao Momoko, though they didn't receive this name until the second migration, the so-called Hanao Eepe, arrived. Momoko is an abbreviation of the word Moko Moko, repetition of the word Moko meaning lizard, which means pointy, slender, tall. This would refer to the tall, slender body proportions of the Hanao Momoko. Where did Hanao Momoko come from? Much speaks for that the initial settlers are from the Marquesas Islands. According to oral tradition, King Hotumatua arrived with his people to Easter Island from a place called Hiva. This very same word can be found in several islands of the Marquesas Islands, Fatu Hiva, Nuku Haiva, and Hiva Oa. Original Rapa Nui culture and language share great similarities to those of Marquesas Islands. With a distance of 3,700 kilometers, Marquesas Islands are among the closest neighbors to Easter Island. There is a monument called Achu Akivi that is said to represent the seven explorers looking back towards Hiva where the first settlers once came from. The viewing angle of this monument and the location of the Marquesas Islands have a difference of 28 degree, which one might regard as quite precise, considering that no compass was available as well as that hundreds of years between the migration to Rapa Nui and building date of the monument had passed. Though what might be too much of a coincidence is that these rumors were unheard of before 1960, the same year the monument was restored. A civilization grew. Aprox 1200. 
The early inhabitants of Tepito Otehenua learnt about the nature of their island and did well in agriculture. The crops were abundant enough for them to invest work into things that didn't produce any food back, and so they developed a tradition of building big rectangular stone platforms called Ahu, where to bury their kings and important people. Raising megaliths. Aprox, 1400 to 1650, probably during the 15th or 16th century, the civilization at this small and isolated piece of land was highly advanced. The crops were sufficiently abundant as to support a part of the population to concentrate entirely on building bigger and bigger statues. These megaliths were bought by other tribes and put on the grave platforms, Ahu, to commemorate those who had passed away. They called the statues Moai to exist. Deforestation, Aprox, 1650. The islanders grew in numbers throughout the generations. Much of the lush palm tree forests were cut down and burnt to clear areas for crops. During the era of Moai building, big quantities of lumber was needed for transportation of the statues. Across generations, more was cut than what sprouted and wood was getting less common. As a result, finished statues awaiting transport started to gather up in the volcanic quarry of Rano Raraku, where virtually all statues were carved. As ultimately the resources of big trees were depleted in the 17th century, the carvers stopped working, adapting to new climate. On the contrary to popular belief, the disappearance of the trees did not extinguish the Rapa Nui culture. The islanders adapted well to their treeless island. The lack of trees made winds dry up the land, but the islanders used different techniques to keep the humidity in the soil. One is the manavai, rings of stone that protected the soil it surrounded to dry out. The less obvious kikiri was also used, areas covered in stone that would keep the soil below humid. The rainwater would also bring minerals from the stones into the earth. Traces of usage of these techniques are highly abundant all over Rapa Nui. Tangata Manu, Birdman Competition at Orongo, Aprox 1700 to 1866. From the beginning of the 18th century, when the Moai carving period had ended, people started dedicating themselves to some extent to the Tangata Manu or Birdman competitions in the village of Orongo, situated on the cliffs of Volcano Rano Kau. Once the nesting season of the Manutara bird, Enner Sudi Turn, started, one representative from each tribe would swim out to the small islet Motu Nui. The first competitor to obtain an egg would swim back and win the title of Tangata Manu for his chieftain, which would grant great privileges for both of them, as well as the rest of the tribe. European Contact, 1722. The first well-documented European contact happened in 1722 with the Dutch Admiral Jacob Roggeveen, even if he possibly was not the one to discover Easter Island. He arrived on Easter Day and chose to name the island thereafter. Instantly after disembarking, they killed 12 people and injured many more for coming too close. It surely had a great impact on the islanders to see such an advanced technology that the Dutch showed. Jacob Rogovine and his crew never reported seeing any statues that had fallen to the ground. Every statue they saw was standing. They report that the islanders were well-built, strong, and extremely white teeth, strong enough to open nuts with. With Easter Island being known to the outside world, European visits gradually increase, especially during the 19th century. Slave Raids, 1862 to 1863. The visiting Europeans generally estimate the islanders to be in the number of thousands until the beginning of the 1860s when 1,500 islanders were taken to work as slaves, which would mean most able-bodied men. Among the kidnapped were the ruling king as well as the wise men who knew how to read the Rongo Rongo script, which today no one is left to interpret. The slaves worked in guano deposits at Chincha Islands and plantations in Peru, a few of these were later released, all of which died of smallpox on the return voyage, except for two people. These two spread the disease to the rest of the Rapa Nui population. The natives had no immune system towards this foreign disease, which resulted in an aggressive decrease of the population. A few years later, only 111 people were left at the island, abandoning the old culture. 1866 
Catholic missionary Eugenio A. Raud, heard about the unfortunate happenings at Rapa Nui, so he went for a nine-month visit in 1864. Two years later, he established a Catholic mission. The missionaries told the natives to abandon their old practices, such as that of the Birdman competition, which they did. They converted all natives to Christianity. No slave trade ever occurred at Easter Island again. Annexation to Chile, 1888. No colonizing country had any particular interest in Rapa Nui because of its remoteness. Britain recommended Chile to claim it to keep France from doing it first. In 1888, Chilean naval captain Policarpo Toro let the current Rapa Nui king Atamu Tequena, who wasn't really of straight royal lineage, but only someone assigned by the real king to rule, sign a deed, giving Chile full and entire sovereignty over the island, while the Rapa Nui translation used words such as friendship and protection. Even so, 1888 is officially the year when Rapa Nui became Chilean. The treaty also consisted of a symbolic act. Atamu Tequena took grass in one hand and dirt in the other. He gave Policarpo Toro the grass and kept the dirt for himself, meaning that the Rapa Nui people always will be true owners of their own land. Among Rapa Nui people, Chileans are still today sometimes referred to as Mauku, grass. Williamson Balfour and Company 1903-1953 Rapa Nui was left alone by Chile until 1903, when the British Chilean company Williamson Balfour and Company set up Easter Island Exploitation Company and signed a contract to lease they land as a sheep farm for 50 years. The natives were fenced in around guarded borders in the area that today is the town of Hanga Roa to prevent sheep theft. Up to 70,000 sheep roamed the island freely. After 1936, conditions were improved. Natives were able to visit the countryside if a permission in written form had been asked and granted. Each family was also given a sheep every now and then. After the Second World War, Synthetic wool was invented, which complicated the market for Easter Island Exploitation Company. As a result of this, together with the constant native uprisings, the company did not renew the contract but left the island in 1953. Rapa Nui Today The Rapa Nui people are today around 3,000. Though not many of the newborn have two Rapa Nui parents, the native language is not widely spoken, mostly among elders. People born in the 1980s or later are often only able to hold simple conversation in Rapa Nui and tend to change into Spanish quite quickly. Deeper knowledge of the ancient Rapa Nui language is today somewhat of an exclusivity. Chile today takes well care of the Rapa Nui culture and the government does what it can to help the islanders to do the same. Through an institution called Kanadi, they offer to pay the costs of well-planned projects presented by the islanders that intend to help with the preservation of the culture in any way. One might see it as some kind of conciliation of the unfortunate events that the world has brought upon the small island of Rapa Nui. Rongo Rongo, the lost Rapa Nui writing language Rongo Rongo, Rongo Rongo in Rapa Nui, is an ancient Easter Island glyph writing. It is the only known native writing in all of Polynesia. Rongo Rongo uses symbols of items, as with the Egyptian hieroglyphs. The Rongo Rongo symbols were written on tablets of wood. Today, only around 25 Rongo Rongo tablets are known to exist, all scattered at museums outside of Easter Island. Lost Knowledge In 1862 to 1863, many slave raiders attacked Rapa Nui. All able-bodied men were taken, among them all the wise men who knew how to read and write Rongo Rongo. Since then, no one knows how to interpret the tablets. Several linguists have tried, but there is no generally accepted theory of how to read the symbols. Easter Island, also known as Rapa Nui, is a tiny island known for its huge Moai statues scattered all over the island. The world is fascinated by the creation of these statues, not only for the impressive size and quantity of them, but also for the circumstances under which they were built. This small island had very limited resources, not much drinking water, no cattle, and no metal. The statues were transported to their final location several kilometers across hilly terrain, all of this being accomplished with the highest leader being a tribal chieftain. The Location 
Rapa Nui is located in the Pacific Ocean on latitude minus 27.15 and longitude minus 109.4, 3,600 kilometers west of Chile in South America. See in Google Maps. Flying from Chile's capital Santiago, which is the closest flight connection, takes around five hours. Culture. The Rapa Nui people are Polynesians, such as Hawaiians, Tahitians, and the Maori of New Zealand. The native languages of these islands are very similar. Music, dance, and art has always been a central part of Rapa Nui culture. The island is today part of Chile, and strong South American influences threaten the existence of the fragile Rapa Nui culture, which a mere 3,000 people are part of. As tourism became a more common part of the Easter Island society since the 1990s, and people travel from all over the world to see this unique culture, there has been an increased pride in the cultural Rapa Nui identity. Today, most newborns that are Rapa Nui are given Rapa Nui names, and parents try to speak the native language to their children as much as possible. During the 1980s and before, most babies were given Spanish names, and parents often did an effort to teach their children Spanish, even if this was their weaker language. The Climate the Rapa Nui climate is classed as subtropical. It is often windy, especially at volcano summits such as where Arango is located. Being located quite a bit below the equator, Rapa Nui isn't as agonizingly hot as Tahiti sometimes can be. Most find the Rapa Nui climate moderate and quite pleasant. During summer, Dec, Feb, day temperature is around 25 degrees C, and winter, Jun Turag, around 19 degrees C. At night it gets quite cold, so unless it's summer, you might want to be prepared with a pair of long trousers if you're staying outside. Table explanation. During February, one could expect day temperatures between 27 and 21 degrees Celsius, and in October, between 22 and 17 degrees Celsius. Rain falls year-round, around 80 mmm, though most between April and June, around 110 mmm. This means that even though rain is less common during summer, Dec and Feb, it is still a good idea to bring a raincoat, especially if you're staying at Easter Island only for a few days. In case these days would be rainy, you would probably want to be able to be outside and still stay somewhat dry. Modern society at Easter Island Rapa Nui locals today live in houses with windows and doors. The town of Hangaroa has electricity generated by diesel engines, though it cuts around once a week for a couple of hours because of failure or maintenance. Internet access is limited and slow, and is only available in the town center. Official languages are Spanish and Rapa Nui, the native language of the island, similar to Hawaiian and Tahitian. Fresh fruit and vegetables are flown in by airplane. Storable food, construction material, etc. is shipped in on a ship approximately once a month. Sometimes the ship is delayed, causing the shops to be short on wares. Tourism After NASA extended the airport landing stretch in 1987 for possible space shuttle emergency landings, tourism has constantly increased and continues to do so by around 20% per year. Tourism is the main source of income for the islanders. In 2012, Rapa Nui received 70,000 visitors. The tourism services of the island are well prepared to receive and take good care of outside visitors. Population increase. The biggest problem, as well as the biggest discussion, is the rapid increase of the population the latest years. The island has gone from having only a few cars in the 70s to light traffic jams by the market in the mornings. This is due to borders being entirely open to the 16 million inhabitants of Chile. Rapa Nui is seen as an exclusive place to live, and the economic situation is considerably better than in Chile, which is why many Chileans choose to move to Rapa Nui. More than half of the inhabitants of Rapa Nui are today Chileans. The general opinion among the Rapa Nui people is that Chilean immigration should be controlled in the same way as it is from all other countries of the world. This is a complicated matter since Rapa Nui is part of Chile, and it would mean that Chileans would not have free access to a part of their own country. Though Rapa Nui is a small and fragile environment, and it is probably only a matter of time before special reasons will be required also of Chileans in order to move to Rapa Nui. Independence from Chile 
A small group called Rapa Nui Parliament wish for independence from Chile. Opinions of this group have been heard all around the globe, even though they are only a few people. The rest of the Rapa Nui population doesn't share this opinion. What's more sought for is autonomy, meaning that Rapa Nui would have right to, for example, create laws of their own. Rapa Nui is dependent on Chile for telephone communication, internet, maintenance of roads, schools, currencies, and everything else that defines a modern life. Without Chile, the people of Rapa Nui would virtually have to go back to living in caves, which is why this island never will be independent from Chile. Economy. Official currency is Chilean pesos, CLP, though U.S. dollars are also accepted. Because of the remoteness, everything has to be flied or shipped in. And tourism, prices are quite high. A meal and a beverage at a restaurant may cost around 10,000 CLP, 30,000 CLP, and a night at a hotel may cost 80,000 CLP, 200,000 CLP. Rapa Nui National Park Many visitors to Easter Island hear about a Rapa Nui National Park and expect to see something similar to other reserves they have seen, only this one has moais. Truth is, borders to this national park are often not visible, and even the locals don't know where the national park areas begin or end. The national park is simply the areas that don't have an owner. These areas make out around 43% of Easter Island. Just as the rest of all Chilean national parks, this one is run by the national organization CONAF. They are in charge of park rangers, signs, rules, maintenance, etc., National Park Ticket. For entering two of the main attractions of Rapa Nui, Rano Raraku and Orongo, visitors are required to show a park ticket. These are bought at the airport or at the CONAF office. The ticket costs 60 USD per person, except for Chilean citizens for whom the cost is only 20 USD. Once bought, the ticket is valid for five days. For visiting Rano Raraku and Orongo after that, you would have to buy a new ticket. Only one visit to each of the sites is permitted per ticket. Filming movies, documentaries, and shows at Easter Island. Many documentaries and show episodes have been filmed at Easter Island. For filming within the National Park, basically anywhere where there are Moai statues, you need a permission from CONAF. The cost of this permission depends on how many days you will be filming and how many sites will be covered. When filming in the National Park, a CONAF park ranger will have to accompany you at all times. No permission is needed for filming in private properties, in town, and anywhere that's not national park. To request a filming permission from CONAF, they will need a detailed schedule of which sites you'll be filming, the exact date and time you'll go to the locations and what scenes will be shot there. Camping at Easter Island The most popular campsite at Easter Island is Mihanoa. It's located just by the ocean in the town of Hanga Roa. You may bring your own tent, but also rent one. Camping under the stars at Easter Island. According to Chilean rules, it is not allowed to camp in any of Chile's national parks. As Easter Island is declared a national park, these rules officially also apply for this island. Though in practice, it is different. As almost half of Rapa Nui is national park, this would mean that locals would basically be unable to camp in nature, which would be too much like living in a glass jar. In practice, locals are allowed to camp in nature. If tourists are accompanied by a guide, they may also camp in nature, but if a guide is not with them, they may not. If tourists are seen by park rangers camping by themselves in nature, they are removed. For the adventurous kind of traveler, we offer a three days, two nights horseback adventure for those who wish to journey through all of the island on horseback. Custom itineraries may also be arranged. Contact us for any custom requests. In conclusion, we have embarked on an extraordinary journey through the history of Easter Island. We have explored the mysteries and wonders of this remarkable place, delving into its captivating past. From the enigmatic Moai statues to the fascinating cultural traditions, Easter Island's history is filled with intrigue and significance. We have witnessed the resilience and ingenuity of its ancient inhabitants, who created awe-inspiring sculptures and built a thriving civilization in isolation. As we continue to uncover the secrets of Easter Island, we invite you, our viewers, to join us on this fascinating expedition. By subscribing to our channel, you will stay connected with the captivating stories and discoveries that await us.
Your support is essential in our mission to share the rich history and cultural heritage of this extraordinary island. Let us celebrate the legacy of Easter Island together, preserving its cultural treasures and sharing them with the world. We encourage you to subscribe to our channel and be part of this incredible journey. Thank you for joining us on this enlightening adventure, and we look forward to bringing you more captivating insights into the history of Easter Island.